Uh, now you get a chance to enter the conversation. As I mentioned, there is a green card you can write a question on, and it'll be brought forward if you hold it up. There are microphones on either side of the room, uh, and we've got an expert co-moderator who is prepared to grill people, too. So uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me just ask if you do go to the microphone to identify yourself and keep your question as short as you can. Uh, let me start things off. Uh, Emery, I don't want to stifle um, you. Please, please uh, jump in. Uh, but um, both uh, Steve and Greg mentioned um, the notion of, of getting people involved, getting the patients involved in this initiative and wondering how you might do that. Uh, one of the issues that I keep hearing about is um, when f folks are assigned to an ACO, they might not even know it. So it's a little hard for them to get involved. Uh, and of course, there are no constraints on them going outside your organization or Montefiore to get care for which you are still held accountable. How do you, how do you deal with those competing values of patient involvement, uh, patient choice, uh, and accountability? I just uh, tell you an interesting story. I, I, I got a phone call from a fellow CEO uh, of an academic medical center not to be identified in, in New York um, and said, hey, what's going on? My father, uh, my father's in your ACO. He didn't sign up. <laughs> so, uh, and he, indeed he hadn't. I mean, it was, he was attributed to us because he had seen a doctor once at Montefiore. So shaking it out was, was not easy. I think... It's fair to say that uh, this is a workaround, and uh, it's perhaps a necessary workaround, and perhaps it emanates from when uh, the president addressed the Congress at the State of the Union, and I always forget his name, but he called him a liar, which I thought was outrageous. Um, and he said, no, I don't lie. There will be choice. So choice was fated to be literally interpreted. Um, you couldn't have a worse construct. That being said, you still need to engage the patients, which is our issue with even the ones that have fewer choices or more narrow networks. And I think, in general, that comes from carrots, not sticks. The patients filled out their satisfaction survey on this, and we exceeded the country. They were happy. Happy patients is a good thing. And um, we can get into a whole other discussion, but things like co-pays and all these things, those are not sticks. Those, those prevent people from taking necessary medicines and so forth. So this was, you had to glue them to you. Well, I, would, I agree. I think that the, the history is that with the AARP and the consumer groups who are trying to help us think through this, you know, the notion of constraining choice just was not um, going to be a realistic alternative early in the days of this. And it was long before the president spoke. Um, and, I, and, and since then, you know, most places that seem to be struggling with this are, you know, versions of the grass is greener strategy. You know, you have to make people want to, you have to use carrots. And it's hard to see Stu over here, Stu Gutterman of the Commonwealth Fund, who I think was the one who brought the phrase to Vermont or New Hampshire, a crusty place where they're farmers, you know, the best fence is a good pasture. Um, you have to think about that for a second or two. But, you know, the, so I, I think it will be an area that we want to do some work on, figuring out how to get the financial incentives and create better attribution and better engagement. Um, but there's something very powerful about choice as a, as a way that makes people feel engaged and, and, and safe. Dr. Sheff, you want to comment on that? The only other comment that I would make is, is, you know, there's sort of two issues. One is sort of the skin in the game issue about, you know, the co-pays, the co-insurance, and it costs them more to go out of network. But the other is the psychological aspect of making a choice. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is some middle ground where, where patients or beneficiaries can choose to be in an ACO. Now, we have to figure out what's the green in that pasture to make them want to make that choice. Um, but just by, by virtue of making that choice, if they're still in an open network but have, but have bought in psychologically, I, I think that there could iteratively uh, be improvement as well. So, so we'll turn that back to you guys. We'll turn that back to you guys. Next round of legislation, let's get some yeah, yeah. of doing that. I, I, I have a hunch that 
the, the uh, fear of choice emanates from a very good place, and it, I made reference to it earlier, which was managed care of the 90s was a failed experiment. And we have to own that because it was not managing care, and patients knew it, and that's what they're reacting to. If they were getting cared for by integrated delivery systems that are easy to navigate and being kept out of the hospital as opposed to being lined down in a bed um, um, uh, for things that uh, you could argue maybe they don't need them or maybe they don't, they'd feel different about this system. So we created that monster. Just to follow up on this line of, of uh, conversation, so how are you um, engaging your patients within the ACO? And so that's one question. And then if you were to survey them, what do you think they would say, what's different? Well, they did survey them, and, and we got very high grades. Um, and we were pleased by that. Um, the care management organization that has 850 people has evolved its view of how we use the data. Um, and I would venture to say in the Pioneer program, because we were, um, knew that everybody was watching it, it was important for us, it was extra important for us to succeed. And we also knew it was a more challenging enterprise because of everything we've discussed. So we used more sophisticated risk stratification techniques. And um, Greg mentioned this. Um, I, I'd have to say we've evolved a little bit past trying to find out who the sickest are. We're trying to find out who the people are who are about to get sick. And that's a little more, it's nuance, but I think it's key. Because a lot of the people that have congestive heart failure, as an example, uh, and we can argue about uh, use and overuse and misuse of the system and so forth, um, it's a bad disease. And, um, and unless you get a heart transplant and 10 people, one person gets them out of 10 who are waiting. And if you know what an LVAT is, which is a bridge to a transplant or a destination, it's not a destination where you want to live. Uh, it's not a high quality of life. So these patients are sick and, and, and they're coming back. You know, I, I think our experience has been that on patients that have engaged with the ACO, they've had very positive experiences. So the folks that have benefited from the care coordination and, and so on, I think have very uh, positive experiences. The, the challenge is on the, is on the folks who, you know, back to the story, don't know they're in an ACO and how we, how we can engage with them um, through brand identity and marketing and so on. Um, I think the other issue around that that Steve's alluding to is that people that are sick can see the benefit of giving up the choice. Because when you're sick, you, you understand how broken the system is, and you're glad to have a quarterback and glad to be in a system that's willing to take that responsibility. But because of the concentration of illness and cost, you know, it's the other 80% that aren't in that category. But will be, and we need to engage with them now to keep them from being there, that those are the 80% that, that see their choice as more important because it's more of a hypothetical issue to them at this point. And so it's engaging that part of the population that I think is particularly challenging because you have, also you have less to offer them now for giving up their choice because they're not needing anything right now. Can I, I don't want to beat this topic into the ground, but is there any difference that you've discerned, and I guess I would turn first to Elliot for this question, between the Medicare experience where you have a statutory choice right and the private sector ACOs that have developed? Do they enroll people without telling them? Uh, most of the private payer contracts I'm aware of have some choice on the part of the patient choosing, telling you who their primary care physician is. For, for our risk transfer agreements, which are 90% of the premium, uh, in Medicare Advantage, um, they've already chosen a managed care product, and we've been delegated all responsibilities by the intermediary. For the commercials, in general, in general, or we're working on some new things, they're shared savings, and they don't. In Medicaid, they do know, because 90% of Medicaid recipients in New York are in managed care. And we have a lot of them. And we own uh, uh, an intermediary, uh, uh, a not-for-profit 
um, with other hospitals. Um, so uh, they know they're in managed care. Um, the duals are going to be a big deal. And the duals, as I mentioned, are huge, huge amounts of money. And suddenly, commercial insurance companies are interested in purchasing products or, or companies that serve the Medicaid population. So we've had to, we suddenly have a lot of friends who are trying to buy our PHSP because they want to get to that dual money. And I think uh, it's incumbent upon us to keep it in the system. The other comment I would make on that is we're in a very similar situation in terms of the breakdown between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, and whether it's attribution-based or patients are selecting PCPs. But on the commercial side, for obvious reasons, there's, there's different and lesser political barriers. And there's a lot of interest in the commercial side that building ACOs, attribution-based, to demonstrate value, and then in a year, in a very quick time frame, offering narrow networks around that product that, that do require limitation of choice. On the, on the patient engagement side, I'd be curious, each of you, when in our survey, we're seeing quite a high proportion, you know, well over half, um, having beneficiaries, you know, involved in advisory panels and helping design and participate in care delivery design. Are either of you doing that? Uh, we, we have uh, uh, community representatives and patients involved. Um, I, I think I neglected to say that <clears throat> if these 850 people are social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, drug counselors, physicians, um, and psychologists, they're professionals. And they're also people that are emerging in new professions. So they're health educators, or they're young people who are in search of a degree, we're training them, uh, of care management. And we call these people on the phone, we go to visit them in their homes, we install technology in their home for certain patients. You gotta be careful because once you install something in the home, no one will ever let you take it out. Um, <clears throat> but they, love being visited. I mean, people really um, enjoy that. Oh, pharmacists are key. Yeah. It's a, it, there are a lot of people who are not so happy anymore. There was a migration to CVS and Walgreens, and there's only three Walgreens in the Bronx, so I'm not sure they're going to have a big ACO. Probably not. You, um, guys, are, you guys are already there. But, but there's, uh, the pharmacists are key, because people, as you know, have bags of medicine, and they have, especially the elderly, and they have no idea what they're taking, and they're mixing them, and uh, it's, it's half the game, in my opinion. We have a, um, all the ACOs, as you know, have board representation uh, from a patient, but additionally, we have a patient advisory committee that we, we meet with on a periodic basis and run through you know, these engagement issues. What can we be doing? We're talking about doing this. What, 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 what would happen if we called you with this message and, and tried to find out what their needs are? All right, we have a couple of questions now. Uh, you've been very patient, go ahead. Hi, my name is Susan Van Meter. I'm with the Healthcare Association in New York State. We're the statewide hospital association. This is a great panel discussion today, so thank you. Um, recently, the Institute of Medicine released a report about overall healthcare spending in the United States, and there were some results that some found um, surprising, including low spending in the Bronx, uh, also Rochester, New York. Um, and there was speculation about, you know, what is the major variable that can explain, or a major variable can like, explain the differences in health spending. And continuing care was something that some of the members of the IOM had mentioned. Uh, and I would just like to ask um, if you could tell us a little bit more about your thoughts about continuing care, coordinating that care, and how you see care in nursing homes, home health agencies, and the like changing uh, over time. And again, thanks for the panel. The, um, um, I hope we don't go down this r rabbit hole, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad to go there. Uh, there was a, uh, a comment by Greg, and I, 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 I want to I draw it out. Um, Medicare payments are different throughout the country and different regions. And um, a question that one could logically ask is, did Montefiore do so well because the payments are so high in New York uh, that there was a lot of room to make savings? Um, I think I'd be, uh, if I was lecturing on you on this, you know more about it than most people, but 
Medicare has a number of things in it that are social missions. It has graduate medical education. It doesn't pay for those 1,300 residents that I educate. It has disproportionate share, which has to do with underinsurance, not just uninsurance. In the Bronx, there are 17% of the population is uninsured, and the vast majority of them are immigrants, and they will not get insurance, even if we have immigration reform, which we need, because it has been said, and it's not politically doable at this moment. It has wage inputs. Um, three quarters of my uh, uh, workforce of 20,000 are in organized labor, they have a living wage, they have pensions, and they have health care. And their health care is not Cadillac health care. It's $5,000 per recipient per year, and it's uh, 6000 for a family. It's pretty, pretty low. Back to the Medicare, uh, Medicare side of it. We were compared to ourselves with some bleeding of a national trend. Um, <clears throat> but that being said, uh, the Bronx... Uh, according to the HSS survey, is the sixth lowest per capita Medicare spend in the country, in the country. Rochester was number one. So there is micro variation within more global regional variation, which is what the Newhouse Commission at the IOM found. And I think it is uh, challenging or maybe an opportunity for the Dartmouth uh, Atlas, and I'll tell you why I think it's an it's it's a opportunity. There isn't a person in this room who doesn't know who Atul Gawande is, and there isn't a person in this room, I bet, who didn't read the New Yorker article. And if you did, you're not going to raise your hands now. <laughs> but it is an intelligent, highly intelligent use of the Dartmouth Atlas because it says, let's take a region and do a deep dive and see if there is micro variation and let's see what causes it and let's see uh, what's underneath it because one size doesn't fit all in healthcare, I can tell you that. So he did that and he found in McClellan versus El Paso that the spend was twice as high and lo and behold, the doctors owned the means of production in McClellan and they were uh, getting tests on people for machinery that they owned. It's as simple as that. He came to that conclusion. He's a better writer than I am saying the words, okay? So what, what I believe we learned from this uh, Institute of Medicine report is that there are different inputs, and the main input to Medicare uh, uh, variation has to do with uh, continuing care and nursing home care which is a very rich benefit in some uh, Northeast states, including New York, uh, and, uh, by the way, the Dartmouth Atlas doesn't include uh, commercial spend and doesn't uh, include Medicaid and doesn't include cash, which is a big deal, not in the Bronx, but it is in Rochester, Minnesota. So it is not describing a region's overall spend. And when it does in a place like the Bronx, because there is a lot of Medicare, it gets more at it, we find that there is regionalization, micro-regionalization. It's not the same in the Bronx as it is when you go into Westchester. <clears throat> yes, go right ahead. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. I have two questions, uh, both easier than what you've just been dealing with. The first, for the gentleman from Montefiore, is do you work with community organizations? Do you help strengthen community organizations? Or are you bringing in all this stuff yourself, like the care management and the home teams? Yeah. Uh, my second question is, how do you compensate uh, the, the primary care physicians. Is it all about pay perf performance and productivity? Okay, so um, we work with a variety of community-based organizations throughout the Bronx and Lower Westchester, everything from churches to uh, not-for-profits to uh, organizations that work with uh, poverty and through poverty programs, and they're very, very important. Um, in terms of uh, the employees of Montefiore, uh, about 15%, 10% to 15% of your uh, salary is uh, incentivized. Most people would say that's not enough to make a difference. Um, I'm not sure it does. It's more about the mission. 
but those are based on quality metrics, not volume metrics, and not panel size, and not from how well you do in terms of managing the care. It's just not how we've done it. For the private doctors, we had to incentivize them to bring them in. They had no reason to come in otherwise. And a lot of that $14 million went back to them. We tried to use it prudently. Thank you. Got a, got a question, Anne-Marie, do you have one uh, ready? I've got a question uh, addressed to Dr. Sheff. Uh, you mentioned that administrative reasons uh, led you to the MSSP uh, and away from the Pioneer Program. For what administrative reasons specifically did you decide to shift? <laughs> sure, I'll, probably the main one um, on the administrative side has to do with a slight difference between the programs and how providers and patients are added, and this has to do with the retrospective versus prospective um, methodology. So in Pioneer, you can only add providers and patients can only be attributed once a year. And in MSSP, it's a more dynamic process. Um, and in large part, we're using this work, as I mentioned, as a platform to, to continue transformation in our community, and so the ability to more dynamically grow it was important to us. Um, so there's a, f a number of questions that have to deal with workforce and wanting to tease out a little bit how your workforce has changed uh, and how you're dealing with or integrating other um, professionals, nurses, um, community uh, workers, etc. And uh, if you could. I'll illustrate it with uh, uh, one or two examples. Um, we have um, nurse practitioners stationed in each one of our emergency rooms. There are four, and they see, as I said earlier, uh, about three hundred twenty thousand visits a year. And their sole job is to uh, identify patients, whether they're capitated, prepaid, or shared savings or not, irregardless. And we made a decision early on that if we were going to sort people by their payment, prepaid, you go here, you go home, uh, fee for service will take you into the hospital, <clears throat> that we were uh, going to lose our way. And we never went that, that path. So this um, nurse practitioner in each of them, and they're there uh, 12 hours a day, has an iPad. The iPad lights up uh, as somebody registers, as somebody likely to be able to avoid an admission um, or a readmission. And uh, their sole job is to, is, is to do that. Um, there's also uh, been a very, as I mentioned earlier, and I think it's important, and we're training people who work at Montefiore or other health centers to, uh, we're retraining them. Uh, they may be billers or whatever, and they want to get into the healthcare world, and we're training them to be care managers. Learn how to talk to people, make phone calls, make sure they got their drugs when they went home, and you know, a whole array of, uh, of issues along those lines. And the third area that I think is illustrative of the change, which I think even we underestimated, is the confluence of uh, mental illness in uh, every population and its impact. I mean, if you have congestive heart failure, as I described earlier, and you're not depressed, there's probably something wrong with you. And if, it, and, and if you're, and if you're uh, a patient taking lots of medications with lots of challenges, there's going to be various levels of, uh, uh, of either obvious or not so obvious mental illness. So we worked very hard to do a collaborative model where we insert mental health uh, guidance for the primary care people and availability of psychiatrists and psychologists and so forth, social workers, uh, as you move up the chain. So those are three examples. But those things keep changing as we learn. Um, I think some of the programs that, are, uh, that had health plans um, that were in the Pioneer that I know of uh, might have confused the health plan with care management, and, and they're different. So I think, uh, and, and the difference is this work cadre. Uh, our system will get to where it needs to go when we get rid of the other 850 people who are just fighting to get paid. They should be care managers. 
because that's a tremendous waste. Because the insurance companies has 850 people fighting with them. And last time I checked, that's a lot of people. I would, add, I would add two other job categories that we see, um, both from dartmouth Hitchcock, where I also spend a lot of time, um, which is another one of the pioneer ACOs, and that's health coaches, sort of people who are worried about the, the folks who are going to get sick. They're lay people trained in motivational interviewing that are working in the primary care practices. And the other are data managers, people who are in the offices trying to help figure out um, and prepare patients for visits and prepare the clinicians for visits so they know what quality measures have, and preventive services that have or have not been delivered and are preparing um, the clinical team, the nurse and the doc, based on the data that's in the registry um, to be prepared for that visit. So those are two other job categories that are emerging. One, one of the questions asked on a card specifically asked whether uh, the involvement of nurses had contributed to the shared savings uh, being able to be generated. Does that show up in any national data or in the experience of our two panelists? I can speak to it just experientially. Perhaps Ellie could speak to it on. No, not on, yet on the data. Okay. Uh, experientially, I mean, I think the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, a lot of what, what Steve is describing is in, in a fee-for-service model, you have the care team is the primary care physician running as fast as they can on the treadmill. Um, and then the minimal amount of supports to keep moving the widgets through that treadmill. And a lot of what the, the care team is about in value-based care is building up enough resource around that, that physician so that, you know, the, the kind of catchphrase that I'm sure you've heard is practicing at the top of their license. So the physician can take care of the complex illness, the nurse can do the complicated education, the health coach can do the basic behavior change. So to that extent, a lot of the navigation work um, and, and chronic disease management work is being done by nursing. And I think, you know, as we all look at these models and the cost uh, of implementing them, I mean, Steve mentioned they received 14 million in shared savings and that all went back out, is, is how do we continue to move that down? So right now it's being moved from physician to nurse. I think it will continue to be moved from, you know, nurse to MA, from MA to lay community health worker and so on. Yeah, our, our home health agency has been uh, remarkably transformed and repurposed. Um, th those are nurses, essentially nurses, that go into the home, and we're using them for more and more di different populations, and not looking at where the revenue particularly comes in, but where the impact could be on this on this program. The inpatient nurses, uh, we have a lean process that's well on its way, where we're uh, allowing natural experiments across the the four hospitals. Uh, uh, of redesigning care and, and getting at that issue of, of top of the license, getting people out of charting. And you've, you've, you, you learn that, you know, nurses are they're doing, they're spending all their time ordering things and do it. They're doing things that no one knows why they started doing it and why it keeps going on. And, and once they are True. liberated of that there's no, like no one said you had to do this, you know, you can redesign it. You know that it's better to go to the bedside and talk to that patient about going home, as opposed to all the charting and all the other stuff. So we, we're seeing dramatic change on both ends of the spectrum. Right. Uh, by the way, we, have, we are buried in green cards here. So if you really, really want to get your question asked, you better go to a microphone. We, may, we waited so long that that young lady went away from the microphone, which means we're going to go this way. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, my name is Dr. Carolyn Moody. Um, my question is for you, Dr. S uh, Mr. Safier. Um, how do you see, I'm an emergency physician, how do you see emergency medicine helping with ACOs? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, the, I am a huge fan of our emergency medicine people. Uh, it's an academic department. Uh, chair of the departments in the Institute of Medicine. Um, he's a scholar, <clears throat> and he's one of the best physicians I've, I've ever made, uh, meant, met. You might have made him, too. I didn't make him. I, I, I pointed him chair. <laughs> um, we need to really rethink about how our emergency rooms work. Um, uh, Colleagues at, at Mount Sinai have a, a, a wonderful program where they move the geriatric patients elsewhere. 
um, because they just have different needs. We're, we're looking at that. Um, we have, our, our nurses in the emergency room have said to us, why is everybody lying on a gurney? It's just clogging everything up. I mean, a lot of people can sit, and they're capable of sitting. And in fact, it might even be better, because they might not get a pulmonary embolus while they're waiting <laughs> to be seen. So, so we're rethinking how that emergency room works. I used the example of the nurse practitioner. When she, and I, there was one person, a she, who was an orthopedic nurse who uh, began the program. When she went down there and started telling the emergency room people that she was going to prevent emissions, they thought she had, you know, four green eyes. You know, it was like somebody standing in front of a restaurant in their mind telling people you could get a better meal down the block or you could go to the supermarket and buy your eggs and, and it's, you know, half the price. So, so because they were conditioned to admitting people. Uh, and, and so we, we really need to get away from that mentality. On the other hand, when, uh, and this is true, 20% of our adults that come in our emergency room do get admitted and they need to be admitted because they're very ill. A lot of them are immigrants and they haven't gotten care, or they're before Medicare, and they've been in between, and they weren't in an exchange. So we need to rethink that area heavily. Yeah, I'd love to just add in a little bit here. If we think of healthcare as a knowledge-intensive industry, I just gave grand round, emergency medicine grand rounds um, and to a wonderful group of emergency physicians, and think about how good you all are at diagnosis, you know, at figuring out what's wrong with patients. How much of that really needs to be done in the emergency room? How much of that could be done by telehealth to a primary care place so that we have much sharper decision making done, you know, with the combination of an iPad and Skype so that you can see someone? I think the question of how do we take the knowledge that's accumulated in ERs around diagnosis in, in complicated settings and triage to observation, re revisit in 12 hours, you know, follow up by telephone. So you guys are the experts in that, and, and you, there will be every, every ACO will want to have you if you think of your job not as seeing just the patient in front of you, but as managing a population of patients with varying levels of acute illness. Yes, go ahead, Bob. Bob Chris with the Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. I haven't heard any discussion of prevention issues so far. I've heard that Primary care in the community really works, especially if you identify people who are at risk of, of various uh, health problems. But I'm wondering if the ACO model itself has some potential for integrating medical care and public health in the same funding stream so that savings in medical care can be redirected to public health, where we are underfunding that tremendously and yet have such a surplus of inefficient dollars in the medical care system. Now, most of the discussion has been on how to improve coordination of medical care, and I'm sure you can squeeze that in many effective ways, but given the poverty rates in the Bronx and in many communities throughout the country. I'm wondering if we need to focus on a funding mechanism that integrates medical care and public health. And I'm wondering if ACOs have any lessons to teach us about that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I trained in internal medicine in Montefiore's social medicine program, um, and, um, and it's, uh, it, it was, the training I got was public health and, and, and care, integrated. Um, I have an institution to run, and um, it's becoming harder and harder to uh, live with uh, compressed payments and, and all kinds of things that, that fly at, at us. One of the ways around that is the ACO because uh, we get away from uh, the volume and putting people in a bed, and we share in keeping people well. Um, I can't be the public health department of the Bronx. Uh, there is a public health department. So we have a strong partnership with them. 
Uh, we, uh, Mayor Bloomberg did all his uh, press conferences at Montefiore, which had to do with uh, uh, 16 ounces, whether you think that's choice or not, and uh, <laughs> we supported it. And, um, and we supported strongly his ban on trans fats, uh, his uh, ABC of uh, eating institutions, uh, his uh, ending smoking programs, they were terrific. And we used the bully pulpit to do that. In the schools that I mentioned earlier, we fought a very hard battle and won to get full fat milk out of the schools and get 1% milk. And we were fought by the same, it's the same people, big tobacco, big sugar, big milk. They fought us. <laughs> And uh, so, so, you know, we, I agree with you, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we need to do that. At, you guys need to do that. We need more money in the public health uh, infrastructure. Oh, but I think you could also think about community-based payment models um, and creating incentives to establish them. The Akron Accountable Care Community is actually set up to share the savings that are achieved within the healthcare, within that region, back toward investments in public health. So the model, um, the model that could emerge if one put pressure on the right people, um, here we are, um, <laughs> is, is payment models that created incentives for um, all health systems within a region um, to work together to lower costs and then get a share of the savings themselves. RethinkHealth.org, uh, which is a program of the Fannie Ripple Foundation, has been trying to start to think about how to do this. Um, Janet Corgan, who left uh, the National Quality Forum, is working with them um, to try to figure out how can these community-based payment models be built, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has just decided to try to help fund them. So you've got a great idea there, <laughs> and I think, I think there is real potential um, to achieve savings and reallocate them to more important upstream purposes. We have a number of questions that relate to payment and uh, incentives. Uh, one of them, actually, uh, uh, it's, it's framed as Uwe Reinhardt and others, and I think the reason that's the case is that there is a video to this uh, point on the Alliance website, what can I say? But Uva and others have warned that ACOs might lead to higher costs in some places as they come to dominate a particularly local market. Is that a real danger, and have we seen any of that in the Medicare or private sector ACOs? And if it is a problem, what's the solution? I neglected to mention that my parent mix is 84% governmental. I get paid what Medicare tells me and Medicaid tells me, and by the way, that's 50-50. And I have 17% uh, commercial insurance. That's the uh, worst payer mix of any academic medical center in the country. There is not a big risk that my prices <laughs> are going to go sky high based on this ACO. <laughs> I, I wish they would go up. <laughs> but you, you also have the right values. <laughs> Thank you. It's not about extortion. <laughs> no, I, I, the evidence, we, we see evidence of consolidation, um, which can have two effects. It can lead to integration and better care, and it can lead to monopoly pricing. Uh, we actually don't have enough data to know how much monopoly pricing is happening, so the challenge, again, to Congress is to figure out how to create transparency in local markets around prices. Uh, we're working hard to try to figure out. It is a major deficiency of the Dartmouth Atlas. We are trying to figure out how to get all the commercial plans to collaborate with us uh, to create local transparency to embarrass the places that are raising their prices um, exorbitantly. We did, we're um, hopeful that it can be done. Um, but it is, it, I think it's a choice, you know, MedPAC has shown uh, that it is largely a choice on the part of the providers. You know, they can choose to raise prices or they can choose to some extent to try to control their unit costs. And uh, places like Montefiore won't be trying to extort monopoly rents from their, maybe because they can't, but probably because of their values. And I think that's the thing we have to call on our local community health systems to say, why are you, why are you here? I agree with that, and certainly the, the culture of the, and the values of the institution matter tremendously. I think the other part of it is that most, most institutions that are participating in ACOs do see it as part of a spectrum towards fuller risk. And, and at that point, the high price point becomes a liability. Exactly. And, and so I think certainly consolidation raises that, that theoretical concern, and there's been lots of scrutiny about it. But I, I think most people that are on this journey see it ending with them taking risk. 
Um, and at that point, um, it becomes irrelevant because you're not you're not billing on a unit you know basis. Yeah, no kidding. Dartmouth no wonderfully negotiated really high prices on one of its global payment contracts. Irony, right? They, <laughs> no savings because they negotiated really high unit prices and then couldn't possibly achieve overall total cost savings because they'd done just that. Yeah, and I, and I think the other dynamic that plays into this, it you know, our market is uh, is more commercial uh, than in the Bronx is, you know, from the healthcare system side, um, everybody is aware that per capita utilization um, needs to go down, at least um, in appropriate utilization. And the question is, what are you gonna do with the fixed capacity? And there's some, you know, aging of the population and population dynamics in various cities, but some of it is market share too. And so a lot of um, institutions that, that are moving towards value-based payments are at the same time moving towards narrow networks, at least on the commercial side, um, which again um, are going to incentivize them to keep the unit price down, uh, but to be successful um, on the whole book of business. Emery? Um, a question, I know the, the topic today is really the Pioneer ACO uh, program, but, um, and this is probably for, uh, for Elliot Moore. Uh, what do we know about, are there differences that are starting to uncover between the private sector and the federal program, or? Um... Um, I have to be a little careful about colleagues who are writing peer-reviewed papers um, and trying to get those out, um, but there are differences. Um, certainly there's much more variation in the private payer arrangements than there is in the federal, because the federal is a one rule, one size fits all. Uh, so that the, the kind, and there's huge variation in the performance measures on the private sector side. Uh, Steve already referred to the, the difficulty that that causes for organizations that are trying to hit multiple performance targets. Um, federal programs, I don't think this is gonna breach anything, seem much more engaged with the safety net, um, perhaps because of um, the regulations and the encouragement of having FQHCs as part of the MSSP. Uh, so there's a, there really is the, probably the biggest surprise so far in our evaluation is the, the very high level of activity in the safety net um, in ACOs. The, the, it, our ex just our experience has been um, some commercial plans with commer you know uh, non Medicare um, were willing to enter enter into risk transfer as early as uh, 1996. So those are risk transfer. Their capitation without a percent of the, the percent of the pr premium is retained by the company, um, and uh, then we hit a wall, and um, you know the the biggest bump we got was with uh, uh, HIP, which is now Emblem, which is a very large insurer in New York that is, insures city workers, and that was a big influx of risk transfer. And, and then we hit a real wall, but post Pioneer ACO, we've been able to take each insurance company on again tenaciously to get a shared savings model. And, we, and, the, and the difficulty here has been to get them to adhere to basically the Medicare approach because of what Greg said earlier, which is you, you, you wind up employing a whole other cadre of people for each insurance company to do it the way they, they want to do it. Because and their struggle is to do one, Aetna wants to do it one way, United wants to do it another way, WellPoint wants to do it another way, and uh, if they would all agree on one way to do it, it'd be good. Greg, I think you mentioned tipping point in, in your, com your remarks. What percentage do you have of payments that are value-based, and when do you get to the point where everybody's gonna climb on the bandwagon? Uh, in our organization, uh, it's easier to answer this on the primary care side in terms of thinking about which patients are in attributed models, and it's probably about 20% of the patients now are in some sort of value-based arrangement. Um, tipping point, you know, Steve mentioned 50%, and I think that there's something really to that number. Uh, part of the challenge is, you know, a shared savings patient is not the same as a capitated patient in terms of tipping point, because one is you're still getting most of your money through the fee-for-service system with some incentive to make a transition. Um, and so I think also depending on what the value-based contracts are, there's some wiggle room on that, that number. 
The, the tipping point for me was this year when um, I have a monthly meeting with the chairman of the academic departments. And uh, the two, uh, this is not a HIPAA violation because you could figure out who the two are. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, the two most verbal in that meeting was the chair of neurosurgery and the chair of orthopedics talking about how they could do less, fewer, and appropriate surgeries, how they can really move it and refine it better. They were talking about unnecessary, I, I mean, I thought, I was hearing things. The, you know, the internists, the pediatricians, uh, the family practitioners, the social medicine people, they, they love this stuff. Neurosurgeons, they don't love this stuff. And they were talking this. Okay. Uh, let me ask you to pull out the blue evaluation forms and fill them out as we go through these last couple of minutes. Uh, one other um, <laughs> revenue-related or money-related question, and we talked about um, the shared savings and the incentives to patients to participate. Uh, is there any value to the notion of letting the patients share in the savings if they're generated? that would give them an incentive to stay inside the network? And is anybody doing that? It, it's an interesting notion. I, I think you'd have to vet it with uh, your lawyers and think about it pretty carefully. I, yeah, and I also think there's, there's issues of, I mean, one of the challenges, you know, going back to Steve's comment about, about co-pays and carrots and sticks is that uh, many of the decisions, even about um, avoidable utilization, are, are complicated and require the judgment of the physician. And so there's a, the risk of over incentivizing a single patient um, to do that. So I think some type of, of, of skin in the game is appropriate. I'm not, I'm not sure that I've heard of anyone doing that particular, particular model. It does seem to be easier to do at an actuarially sound level of sort of joining a health plan that saves you money on your annual premiums than at the point of care does make me nervous, yeah, and yeah. the lawyers would be all over the potential conflicts of interest that might, you know, that might emerge. Could, can I make a comment? Uh, um, I'm just listening to the whole program. I want to I want to step back a second because um, I think it's important for you all. Um, for reasons I described, and I could spend more time describing it, we went down a certain path um, 18, 20 years ago. And we lost serious money for the first five years. And by the way, we didn't have it right. So it took time and money and focus to stay on this course. The problem with Congress and the prob problem with uh, the states is public policy tends to get corrupted and turned into, you gotta turn on the dime. I mean, people are counting the savings before the program is even created or minted. And if we rush this too much and under invest in it, and by the way, I didn't get a dime other than the shared savings. There's a lot of people from CMMI that, I mean, the reward for being a pioneer was you're a pioneer. So the, the the, the, the serious money is going out for re-emission programs and all kinds of other programs coming out of here. And I'm, I think that's a good thing. That's, my point is not the opposite. This takes time and money and focus and a force field that pushes you down that field. That's the, the goal of government. But when you start making the savings before the program's out the door, the program won't work. It will not come to fruition and we'll still have a fragmented system 10 years from now. I, I apologize, but we are at the end of our time. Um, thank you for uh, your, your rich participation. You deserve a hand. Uh, let me thank our colleagues, Anne Marie and her colleagues at the Commonwealth Fund. Um, you again for asking good questions and keeping us going. And uh, this time, I would like you to join me in thanking our panel for this wonderful discussion of a very complicated project. <laughs>